Now I want to turn our attention back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and the reading this morning. And this is an instructional section, may I just remind you of that, from the Apostle Paul. It's as though he were sitting with us and explaining some things to us about Christian living and our purpose in Christian living. He's already addressed some things concerning marriage and singleness. And we come now to sort of a, a, a parenthesis as he reminds us of some things that are essential for all of us where we are. And I think especially his focus here is upon those who have just become Christian. And it's very important as we have energy uh, to spend that energy wisely in the things that God would have us to do. And with that, let me just once again ask God's uh, mercy, and now let's jump into this study together, please. Father, we thank you for your precious word, and we thank you that every bit of it is for us and our understanding that we might walk with thee and know thee. Oh, bless our time together now as we look in your word and at these verses before us. Guide us, precious Lord, that we might honor you, that we might understand what you'd have us to do and have us to be. And please glorify your name, Father, through what is done here. Work by your Holy Spirit, we beseech you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. When I was first saved in my early 20s, one of the first things that I did is get rid of all my 78s. Now, you uh, young people don't know what that is, but that was record albums. And so I took Elvis and Johnny Cash and the Righteous Brothers and uh, the Beatles and all that stuff, and I had a big stack of those things, and I took them out and threw them in the dumpster and got rid of them because I didn't want to have any memory or remembrance of my old life at all. I understand today that those things are collector <laughs> items and probably I'd be worth something, but be that as it may, that's what I did. And that is understandable because when you first become a Christian, when you're enlightened to the things of God, all of your brain sensors, as it were, following conversion are kicking in. And you have this overwhelming glorious thing. It's like you come, you get up in the morning and the sun means something different. The creation around you means something different. And it's overwhelming and you think of the insignificance of your old life and you want to get rid of the old life. And you want to start with the, with the new. It's a little bit like a child on chocolate, I think, you know. Um, but it's a little bit on the raw side. I wanted to change my old life and to take measures and to break all reminders of the past. And that is the, one of the tendencies of all of us when we come to Christ is to what do I do with myself? What do I do with my life now that I'm a Christian? How can I best position myself to serve the true and the living God and make my life worth something? Because there's this recognition that the old life is worthless. Well, that's, I think, is somewhat what Paul is dealing with here as he's answering these questions that people have about just basic things. We don't exactly know what the questions are, but the answers that he gives gives us some inclination. And so when we start looking at what I've called here service comprehension and his sovereign calling, beginning in verse 17, he says, only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each in this manner, let him walk, and so I direct in all, all the churches. Assigned here is the Greek word meridosa, which means a, uh, apportioned. Uh, in fact, it's, it's uh, often translated that way in the New Testament. Sometimes it's translated divided. And uh, if, if you look at Romans 12, verse 3, I won't get you to turn there, but there he's talking about faith and the fact that God has allotted, and that's the word, the same word, allotted to each a measure of faith. The idea is a distribution, 
and a distribution of by God, by design, and by purpose. God has precisely and wisely given each Christian exactly what they should have according to circumstances, issues, difficulties, challenges. We might say that this is the second cousin to Romans 8, 28. He works all things together for good to them that love him and are called according to his purpose. Now, a new Christian, raw with energy, may seek to get, as it were, the cart before the horse. I hope you're following me. And as in the old life, what the person was, was totally self-absorbent. Our brother talked this morning about self-centric. In the new life, if we're not careful, we can be self-absorbent in what we think are the things that God would have us to do, are self-centric. And I believe that is largely what has become of the church in America. So focused upon ourselves that we can't see that there is a much greater purpose here called assigned or apportioned or allotted to us precisely by design given to us. And he says here, as God has called each. Called is the Greek word kaleo, and it means summoned for Christ. Uh, it, it is the call of God which is effectual. And the idea is the person is awakened to the truth and placed in Christ as one of his. It's our summons to salvation. Uh, again, think of Romans chapter 8, verse 30, where it's, where he talks about being called and, and uh, justified and conformed, that, we'd be to, that we might be conformed to the image of Christ and those whom he has called, that's his summon, he will ultimately glorify an unbroken chain of events. And so we're the called ones, the most privileged people of all the earth. Now I want us to remember our calling so that we won't get self-absorbed. Look back at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, just for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, what Paul says in this same context, for consider your calling, that is the same word, kaleo, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, the base things of the world, and the despised God has chosen the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. And he goes on to say, by his doing you're in Christ Jesus. Everything is focused on him and not on us. And that's why he's chosen you and me, and we aren't much because we are not supposed to be much. He is supposed to be everything, and we're supposed to be nothing, and we are nothing. And so as Paul is discussing here what it means to be a Christian, how do we expend our energy, and where do we start, and all of that. It has to start with the understanding that I am nothing, and He is everything. And the energy and the focus must be on Him. And, and so Paul is reminding back in our text that the Lord has assigned to each one, has God has called each. And you don't need to, 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 because you have this new awakening, this new understanding of the truth and the purposes and the plan of God and all of that, you don't need to start running down the street with your shirt tail on fire thinking you're going to do something mighty and great and glorious for God because you and I are nothing. I think that's the general attitude that must be here and must be under, understood. And so he talks about God wanted you to be what you are and where you are when he called you. He didn't make a mistake. 
What are you when he called you? The foolish things of the world, that's what we are. He says, in this manner, let him walk. Now, he's not talking about walk like a fool, but he's talking about don't be focused on changing your circumstances in some kind of external way. Every person used of God throughout the Scripture did not make themselves. God took them and shaped them to be what he wanted them to be. It wasn't their energy that did it. Moses said, Lord, I can't even speak. And God reminded him, who made your mouth? I'll work with you. You need to trust me. And frankly, if God had wanted some, someone uh, sensational to work with, he certainly wouldn't have chosen any one of us. No offense to you. <laughs> I know you're nice people and I love you. But even the best of us are not much, is the whole point. So back in our text, he says, in this manner, manner is the word how to, in the way connected with or what preceded what he was talking about before, circumstances, conditions, etc., in this manner, he says, walk, perepetio, what you are occupied with, in other words, keep living your life in the sphere in which you are found. Don't try in your own energy to be something that you are not. God may providentially change your circumstances. In time, very likely he will. But right now he's saying... It is not your responsibility to attempt revolution because you have become a Christian. Except in the, if, if you happen to be involved in immoral activity, I think that would be an exception. But he's talking about you're called where you are to begin to be a light in that place. Would you look over at Ephesians chapter 6? Ephesians chapter 6. Look at verse 6, or uh, uh, verse 5, start there. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart with good will render service as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. Now, we won't get there today, but he's going to talk about slaves in our context today. It would be our boss or wherever, whatever we're called to do in that regard. What are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be living and acting like Christ. We're supposed to be a light. We're supposed to be doing whatever we do as unto the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he goes on to say in this text, and so I direct in all the churches, this is not a unique rule or principle only for Corinth, it is for all Christians. And then he goes on to say in verses 18, serving priority, he says, was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? He is not to be circumcised. Now, this is very likely a metaphor because that church, the early church, was consistent of saved Jews and Gentiles mixed together. And what he's saying is, if you're a Jew, don't despise your Jewishness. Don't try to cover it up. Don't try to be something that you're not. And if you are a Gentile, don't try to be something you're not. Don't try to be a Jew. All of these things with the energy and the rawness of religion have a tendency to take over 
and they are all externals. And that's what he goes on to say in verse 19. And this gets into the study that we've been doing in Galatians, really, when he says circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. It doesn't matter. The, the uh, Abrahamic covenant has been fulfilled in Christ, and it's behind us, and we don't need to be looking for signs in that regard. These things mean nothing to us today. What matters is Jesus Christ. And I think that's what he's going on to say here when he says, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Now somebody will say, well, now wait a minute. Are we right back to the Decalogue? The Ten Commandments? And some people think that's what this is referring to. I want you to look forward to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This word commandments is ontele, and in chapter 14 and verse 37, Paul says, If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's ontele, commandment. Now my point in taking you here is that when we're talking about, back in our context here, um, the commandments of God, we're not talking about a specific group of commandments and taking those out of context. The things that I write are on to lay. They are the commandments of God under the inspiration of God. So really what we're, by extension, what we're saying is, is that everything in the Word of God understood in its right context, rightly dividing the word of truth, understanding what God is projecting and telling us has to do with the commandments of God. And we cannot, in that regard, focus on just the externals. That's what the Pharisees sought to do. List out of things that we don't do. And let's just try to keep those things externally, and that makes us okay. But this refers really to the body of truth derived from God's Word. And that's not something that you can go through and extract, well, let's do this, and let's don't do this, and then let's do this, and let's don't do this. It becomes a mindset. It becomes the very mind of Christ. It becomes a way of thinking in everything that we do. And this word here that is used for where he says keeping, and that word keeping is tarasis, a and it has to do with constrainment, confinement. In fact, that word is only used three times in the New Testament. And the other two places that it is used, interestingly enough, is the book of Acts chapter 4, verse 3, and Acts chapter 5, verse 8. And in both of those places, that word is translated jail. And what Paul is saying here with this keeping of the commandments is that your mind and your heart is to be constrained, held captive by the very Word of God, the Word of Christ. And do I remind you that that's what the Bible is all about. Christ Himself said that. You search the Scriptures, and in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which speak of Me. It's all about Christ. It's the mind of Christ. It's being constrained and confined to His mindset and His will. And that is far different and just trying to have a bunch of external things that we try to follow and that we can get sidetracked on. That's why Christ said in his prayer in John 17, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. And as we take that word in and study it and understand it, and it comes to life by the Spirit of God, 
it begins to transform us from within. And we have the same kind of constraint that the Lord Jesus had on himself when he came and said that I didn't come to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Not his own will in the flesh because he was the God-man, but the will of his Father with a full understanding of everything about him. We talked about this morning the plan of God and the purpose of God. All that is included here. It's not a matter of, well, I'm going to walk the, do, the don't path. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to chew that. I'm not going to drink this. I'm not going to whatever. It has to do with the mind of Jesus Christ. Am I serving him? Am I living for him? And I believe that's what Paul is talking about. We don't go to a palm reader to understand what the will of God is. Nor do we mechanically go through the word and, well, it's, we don't want to do this because he said over here and don't do that. But it's a heart issue. It's a heart transformation. It's the very new covenant that we find in Ezekiel chapter 36 where he takes out the heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh and writes his law upon our heart. And we desire to please him. He's our new master. And we serve him and think like him because we are implanting the word of God in our minds and hearts that we might know him. Now, Christ was superior to his circumstances. He didn't get sidetracked on a, a bunch of foolish religion. But he lived a glorious, supernatural, wonderful existence in every way that shined his beauty as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we, as his under-shepherds, are supposed to do the, th the same thing. It's not about me. It's about him. And it's about him working through me. God's purpose and plan working through me. Verse 20, he says, each man must remain in that condition which he was called. And this is actually a command. And I think the reason for that is because the tendency is for us to get off track. He, he's not talking about to continue doing things that, that you did in your old life, but he's talking about serve God where you are. Remain as minnow. Abide. Continue. Dwell. The gospel is not more suited somewhere where people are real, have a lot of religiosity and go through a lot of motions, but the blessings of usefulness can prevail wherever a person is, is engaged. And the idea is be a light wherever you are. God called you where you are. And, and Paul, I believe, uh, sees this as such an important matter, even back to verses 18 and 19, that we don't get sidetracked, any of us, on the externals. But our focus is Jesus Christ. And Christianity centers in Christ and has nothing to do, at least directly, with what we do externally. It's a life-changing proposition. It's new creaturehood. And so our main goal is not personal reformation or societal reformation, but transformation. You know, I've, I've used the passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 where we talk about there, uh, Paul says that, that I'm afraid that you have gotten to a point of being sidetracked from your purity and devotion to Jesus Christ. And that's where we want to make sure that we're not. And so with that in mind, 
Um, we're really dealing with issues here that are the common issues that we always have a tendency to stumble over, which is religion versus reality. I want you to turn to Philippians 3 just for a moment. Philippians chapter 3. Here was the Apostle Paul, the great Pharisee, the Pharisee of Pharisees, the most religious man that the world could find. And, and God, who almost has a sense of humor, took this man and made him his great apostle. He says in, in chapter 3, verse 4, Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. And he gives his list of credentials, and I won't go through that. But in, in all of the externals, he says at the end of verse 6, he says, found blameless. I, I took care of all of the external things in my zeal that I thought was for God. But he goes on to say, whatever things are gained to me, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ. Do you see that? We are constantly in this friction, you and I, of trying to impress God somehow or another, trying to move in ways that, that we desire to be pleasing to God and to be religious when really and truly the one thing that we must begin with always is that I may know Him. Amen. That I may know Him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3 addresses the issue, at least in the first part of that verse, of what God's will for you and I is. And he says it's our sanctification. And our sanctification, if it's boiled down to simplicity, is Christ's likeness. It's just that simple. And Paul says it repeatedly, and we have to be reminded of it repeatedly, and especially in our culture and world, in our superficiality of self-absorbed and self-centric Christianity that is going around where people think that by something that they do or something they can do or, or something that they want to put their name on a brick or something else is going to show how, what a fine person I really am. When it needs to be purity and devotion to Christ in closing, I want you to look with me at Isaiah chapter 6. And I tried to think of how this little bit that we've looked at today in a hurry can be summarized. And I think of Isaiah, and he was obviously a good man. Isaiah was a man that was trying to serve God. And it's just interesting to me that we come along and all of a sudden, in, in chapter 6, we read something just really peculiar here. He has this glorious vision of God <laughs> in glory. And we see in verse 3, it says, he's looking at these cherubim, and they're crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And that's exactly where we are today. The whole earth is full of his glory Everything is about Him, and yet we can't see it unless we have the blinders removed, unless we have our ears unstopped. And he goes on talking about the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of Him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. And what was His reaction? You know, I must really be a special man that God has showed this to me. And I'm going to go forth in the energy of my flesh and really 
knock them dead, you know? Kind of like in the Olympics, you know? Man, I've got it. I'm, I know that I can do this. It's not what he did at all. Amen. No bragging. Amen. He says, woe is me. I am ruined. And my friend, that, I believe, is what Paul is really indirectly addressing here. Here's a man that came to grips with who God is. And our calling is to come to grips with who is God. We have to have that is our foundation first. If I am trying to run ahead of that foundation, if I'm trying to work around that foundation, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to do anything that has any value whatsoever. It's all going to be externals. It's all going to be a pile of junk. Whatever things were gained to me, I counted but loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And notice what he says at the end of verse 5, For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And that's the first place that we need to stop and think. Our brother this morning took us to, and hold your finger here, and I, I can't help but think of that. And boy, I, I learned some things this morning, brother. Thank you. Look at Psalm 46.10. This really sums it up. <laughs> it's amazing how God puts things in front of you. Cease striving, or King James, it's be still, and know that I am God. Cease striving and know that I am God. Quit your own silly, selfish effort and know that I'm God. Get to know me. And then, because what follows will follow, I will be exalted among the nations. He's not talking about the psalmist. He's talking about God. Cease striving. Know that I'm God. And I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And by the way, that's going to happen. And whether you and I are a part of exalting him on the earth is going to be our privilege if that be the case. But it's going to happen anyway. As Christ said about when he was entering Jerusalem, he said, if you don't cry out, these rocks can cry out. God can make anything happen, but his name will be exalted. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And the, po the point is... Are we doing it now? Are we knowing him first and foremost now and then and then only? Can we be useful? I think one of the biggest problems that we have in the mission area is this country now and so-called superficial Christianity is just pumping out a cesspool of junk. And we're trying to carry our cesspool of junk and, and thinking across the ocean and across to other places and be witnesses for su supposedly Christ over there, but you can't with a bunch of junk. His name must be exalted. Amen. And so back in Isaiah 6, God had to do something to Isaiah, and he did. In his humility, he recognized that he was nothing. And the seraphim flew with a burning coal in his hand, taken from the altar and with tongs, and he touched my mouth with it. And the idea there is presented graphically to us is that God is working on Isaiah. And God must work on us. And he does that today by sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. We need to get to know God so that we're not promoting something of ourselves so that we're not out giving someone the wrong idea and the wrong impression of what this religion thing, this Christianity, is truly all about. And then he goes on to say, your sin is taken away and your iniquity is taken away. You now have your head on straight. You're now a new creature. And then, verse 8, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send?
What is your purpose in life? In the energy of your flesh, you can start thinking you can serve God. But God must get you and I straightened out before we're worth anything so that he becomes everything. And he says here, whom shall I send and who will go for us? There's the Trinity, praise God. And he says, then I said, here am I. Send me. Do you see the order of things there? We don't get the cart before the horse. And so the, the question today is, do you know Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about did you walk an aisle, did you sign a card, but did you even get baptized? And we're going to have a baptismal service. I, I hope that if you've never been baptized and your hope and confidence and trust is in Christ alone, you'll talk to me about that. But it needs to be real. You need to come to the end of yourself as Isaiah did. Woe is me, I'm undone. And, and let God do his work through you. Let his light shine through you. Then you can be an effective steward and he may send you to Romania. I don't know. It doesn't, doesn't matter. But we must be prepared and we must have our heart and our head right and our desires and affections right. And we must be wanting then within the, the bowels of our being that I want to follow his plan. I want to be a part of his purposes. I am a privileged child of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hear my Lord, send me. It may be that your calling is right where you are, and that's what Paul was saying, first things first. But are you being a light where you are? Do, do people around you know that you serve a risen Lord, a king, and that you're not your own? You're bought with a price? Do they know that? These things are very important, and we thank God that, that Paul has given us clarity and wisdom in these things. The Christian priority and goal is to foremost know Jesus Christ personally, thoroughly, intimately, progressively, uniquely, and then he's ready for use. The actions or the, quote, good works or changes of the Christian then follow naturally, correctly, when we know our Lord and begin to walk with him. He will lead us where he wants us to go and what he wants us to do. Let me ask you to bow with me, please. Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word, and we pray that you'd bless everybody here. And as we move to the Lord's table, Father, help us to focus even there and its purpose upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And with grateful hearts, come to you with thanksgiving and joy for all that you have done. Help us, Father, to understand what is truly important, to understand your ways and to walk in them, we ask in Jesus' name.